Hey, what's up, party people? Happy post-conference aura to all of you. Welcome to This Week in Mormons. I'm Jeff Openshaw. It's nice to have you with us. Appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, we're not live streaming this episode, as you know, because you're getting this through your podcatchers. Sometimes we do that, but not this time around. So uh, if you want to like pay for us to have professional Zoom or something, I will do that. I would feel guilty. Maybe not guilty. Like We have a paid Zoom account for my ward, but I feel ethically compromised if I were to use that to record this weekend more. I just don't think that's an appropriate use of, of funds. So we're not doing that. Anyway, we're excited to bring conference for this weekend. We got a, a little trio here today and we're going to talk about the weekend. We're thinking, stop laughing, Haley. It's just good. It's just good. <laughs> I just, I, I'm just really hoping we sing. <laughs> that's what Jeff, we're saying, Jeff I think she's allowed to laugh. She's a you know. uh, Haley's only last. So uh, I'll introduce our guest. We've got Haley Smith. How are you doing, Haley? Nice I'm you. doing great. Thanks, good Jeff. Everybody. And Devin Thorpe is here. What's up, Devin? Hey, it's great to be here. Nice to have you both. Haley's probably laughing because six months ago we recorded as well and had some a couple of last minute cancellations. So we wound up a trio. But then the episode wound up being really nice. We all talked yeah. in, in, in the end how we had kind of a more robust discussion than when we have like 10 people on at once. So Right. And so my plan to sabotage everyone else so it could, yes. would just be us worked and it worked again. <laughs> <laughs> really, the point of this is I try to get as many people as I can so they can speak intelligently and I can just kind of sit back and just play moderator. And <laughs> the point of this is to out, you know, um, to offload my workload, really. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, but we're excited to talk conference. You know, special episode this week. Got the whole weekend uh, of conference out of the way. I enjoyed it overall. Thought it was a, a great stretch of conference. There's plenty of it I missed and did not take in as much as I wanted because you're fighting children. I love it whenever there's like one talk when they're talking about like having peace in our homes and like during these remarks, I've got kids on the floor like wrestling and fighting with each other over stuff. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. This is great. This is great. This is what I'm feeling. How was it for you guys? What did you What did you all think? Any Any major takeaways before we, you know, go into any specific talks? Well, yeah, yeah there. I, I have a lot. Oh, let me Devin's let me ready. start oh, good. with one. Devin's ready. Well, Jeff, you made me think. Right, I had to actually pay attention to general conference and think Sorry. about what are, what was important. But yeah, but uh, the first thing that struck me as I was watching and cause we're, we're used to this, right. But I still think it goes, uh, with, it needs to be mentioned that, that president Nelson is 112 <laughs> and looks better than half the quorum of the 12. Uh, half the quorum look like they're older than he is. And, and he's by far the oldest, isn't he? He's actually 97, but yes, yeah, still. Yes, that, whatever I said. He will be 98 yeah, in September. So that's, that's, that's legitimately yeah. old. Yeah. For, for sure. Yeah. As opposed to, yeah. Old, my wife yeah. and I were talking yeah. about this the other day. Yeah. When you turn 80, that's... you're happy to be 80 and you, you, you're okay to be called old. The dude is a high school graduate older than. <laughs> that's true. Then 80 years old. Uh, I mean, he is seriously old and he looks like he's ready to go for a run. I know. Uh, at any moment. Uh, that's pretty incredible. I mean, I remember you guys are too young to remember uh, President Hinckley, but uh, President what? Hinckley was a pretty old guy. First, first of all, thank you. Okay. I speak for Haley as well. Thank you. <laughs> But, but uh, President Hinckley, um, <laughs> President Hinckley did not look like he was ready to go for a run the last few years. No, he slowed. He 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 noticeably slowed down there near the end. Yeah, my first yeah. prophet was Kimball, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. So you've got a couple of birthdays. I've got to be under few? my belt before Hinckley. Which yeah. mine, mine too. <laughs> yes, Kimball. Yeah, was Kimball. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. Contemporaries. Yeah. I think yeah. I think yeah. mine was David O. McKay, though I don't remember him. You're at not all. that old, Devin. Prophet. Come on. But then again, when David O. McKay died, everyone thought we'd have Harold B. Lee for a long time, and then that didn't last. Yeah. And then Joseph Fielding Smith was very ill. We did have a very quick jump between McKay and then it was only yeah. a matter I of like three met, years. I actually met Dave, uh, uh, what's his name? The the guy you mentioned after David O. McKay. What was his name? Um, Harold B. Lee. Harold, Harold B. Lee, yeah. I, I actually met and shook his hand during his tenure as prophet. Uh, That's that was my first, the first prophet I met. Second shortest in uh, modern church history. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. like, I was like six years old. I remember thinking it was really a cool deal to meet the prophet. Wow. I have always been impressed. You know, the Lord's hand is in this. I think some of this is just life, but I, I do see the Lord's hand in a lot of it. Like just the fact that you've got someone like President David O. McKay, 
who was president for like 20 years, basically, this whole stretch. And he slowed down too yeah. by the end. When President Lee was coming and he was comparatively young and people thought yeah. President Lee was going to be around for a very long time. Then he got sick and passed away. Joseph Fielding Smith had a lot of health problems and they actually manifested themselves and he didn't last. President Kimball had major health problems. And so, I mean, I, I've talked to my mom about this many times and she was like, yeah, after the previous two prophets dying reasonably quickly, when President Kimball came in, everyone was like, oh man, we're going to like go through this again. Like he's not going to yeah. last long either. Yeah. And then he was around for a, a very long time. I and mean, he lasted what was it, 10 or 12 years. It was at least that long. I mean, he died in what, 85, I believe. I just don't remember what year he officially. Yeah, I think it was 85. On. It was right after my mission. Yeah. Cause I remember I, I had met him as well as a young man. I lived in his ward and, uh, kind of <laughs> knew just him, true. visited him in his home. And, uh, but, but the, hold on, hold on. I kind of knew him and visited <laughs> him in his home. I think you're underplaying your relationship to church. Yeah, it was a, it was a cool thing. Uh, okay. I remember it was his birthday. Uh, back in uh, what 1976, and we were talking about the fact that it was President Kimball's birthday, and I thought, "Wow, it's President Kimball's birthday today!" And he lives right up the street, so I ran home from primary. You know, I'm like 11 years old. I ran home, I made him a birthday card, and ran up the street and took it to his house. And like, I don't know if I don't think his, he had a security guy that parked out front all the time, but I think he wasn't there. So I just went to the door. Knocked on the door. President Kimball <laughs> opened the door, brought me in, introduced me to his wife. We chatted for a while. I gave him the birthday card, wished him well, and went home. Uh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, it was a cool the, thing. The things you can do in Salt Lake City, I guess. <laughs> I know. In the right. 70s. <laughs> yeah. The closest yeah. thing I had to that, there, there was a, a female associate of mine who no, I did not actually date, but lived up in like the avenues in Salt Lake City when I was in college at BYU. And her roommate was President Faust's granddaughter. And one time she texted me and she was like, President Faust is just like over here hanging out with us right now. Like we're watching Pride and Prejudice. We're just like kicking it. The <laughs> Kira Knightley version. But then, but, and so that alone is funny. But then he says to them, I'm paraphrasing, but this is secondhand, but he says to them, have you ever been on a tour of like the Salt Lake Temple? And they're like, well, like, we've done sessions there. He's like, okay. So he took them on like a tour of the upper, like the whole temple, like the upper rooms, like walking oh, wow. them around, like, this is where the 12 meet. Here's the first presidency's area. Oh, there's the Holy of Holies down the, down the hallway. Wow. Right that's there. a nice flex. Was, yeah. <laughs> oh right. Gosh. I mean, I remember hearing about this. I was like, you kidding me? Like, I, can you tell, can you tell me if you like, He's like oh, this you movie's know? pretty cool, but, uh, yeah. like, like next time, can you put on something very long, put on like Patton or Lawrence of Arabia or something and I will get in my car and just happen upon and say I was in the neighborhood. Um, yeah. But other than that, I've met President Oaks. That's that's the most I've got. That's cool. Yeah, Same. I uh, I had a weird, you know, my last, and I'll, 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 this will be my last story of this. Oh, uh, okay. Please forgive me, but I <laughs> I was de- I actually had a very good friend in the Benson family, and so I was introduced to one of his granddaughters and went out with her a couple of times, and uh, but she was living with President Benson. She was like kind of a personal aide to him. Huh. you know, as a granddaughter. And so when I would pick her up to go out on a date, I would pick her up at President Benson's place. Uh, so Please tell me you uh, got into politics, given your politics and President Benson's politics. I really want that <laughs> to be. Yeah, I was inspired by President Benson to get into <laughs> politics. So, but yeah, that, the, so the first time I picked her up, she actually took me upstairs and kind of gave me a tour. And President Benson was just like asleep in his bedroom. I, we didn't go into his bedroom. No, and, you like, should have gone in. Just, just, just loomed. It just stood over him, just like yeah. awkwardly, just <laughs> yeah. Of him. Um, but yeah, the, the, when you grow up in Salt Lake, there are weird things that happen. Weird yeah, that happen. no, I, I I believe it. Well, the time I met President Oaks was it was the last conference in the Tabernacle before they inaugurated the conference center. So I, I went up there from California for that. And back then, it I did I do miss this. The brethren would often just kind of walk the aisles before it started. They wouldn't just sit oh. up on the stand. Resolutely. Now it makes sense. Conference center is very large. I get it. But they used to just kind of walk around the tabernacle, just greeting people and saying hi and shaking hands. And so he just came down our aisle. And I always remember there was this little old lady next to me and my mom. And he's shaking hands. And she just says, she shakes his hand and she says, and now who are you? <laughs> and, he, and I loved it because he just said, he's like, oh, I'm, just, I'm Brother Oaks. It's nice, I'm Brother Oaks. It's nice to see you. And I was like, all right, good deal. That was... <laughs> That, uh, that was a great experience. And then if you've ever been in like 
Devin, have you ever been down like in the parking lot for the church office and administration buildings and that, you know, that parking lot, you know, the spiral ramp that comes off of uh, East Temple that goes down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, If you go in there to get into the administration building, the one with the 70s, not the office building, there is a vestibule to get in from the parking lot. And it's just, it's just a funny, a funny juxtaposition because you have a parking lot, a parking structure, right? But then behind some glass is this room. It's all this wood paneling, the typical plush chairs and a security guard and stuff. And it just it seems so out of place because it, visually it looks like it's just sitting in the middle of a parking lot, but that's how you get in. So we were uh, going to visit. My mom's boss was in the 70 at the time. And oh, as we're wow. waiting in this little room next to a parking lot, and just outside the door in the parking lot, there's a line of 15 Toyota Avalons for the, for the brethren. I don't know if they had a hookup at a dealership or a, who knows what, but <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. And they're all, all their spaces are marked. And uh, Neil A. Maxwell just walks out going to his car, but he was the coolest guy. He stopped what he was doing and just walked over and talked to us for like five minutes before he took off. And that was just funny. Oh, that and, is cool. Yeah. It is cool. We're all just sharing fun stories of, of mostly not alive church leaders. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. He's, he, he might, he, in my mind, he's probably the smartest apostle we've ever had he was famous for that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he was, was a, like wicked smart <laughs> wicked smart so Can i you do say wicked you. smart about a uh, an apostle i don't know Maybe sure i, I mean if, if you're so. if you're from england sure. yeah okay. it's appropriate <laughs> i don't know it sounds inappropriate but let, let's <laughs> pretend it's appropriate <laughs> anyway yes president nelson i was even telling my kids like He's so he's just so sprightly. He's just bouncing around. Just yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to be stunned whenever he passes away because I all will. It's going to randomly happen one day, and it's not going to be like there's a slowdown. Wouldn't it um, be something? You know, almost no one lives past 115, but 115. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be weird to see, you know, President Nelson go through this whole process? You know, serve as president for 20, 25 years. If he I mean, made it until 115, that'd be really bizarre because then you'd be talking a lot of his would-be successors would all also. He would outlive all yeah, of them. Yeah, I mean, it, he would probably attend uh, David A. Bednar's funeral. And that would, you know, think about that. Because when, when David A. Bednar very... was, was called into the Quorum of the Twelve at age 12, we all thought, well, he was going to be president <laughs> for sure. Well, he's 69 now. He turned 70 this year. So he could oh, still be hard around. To be, Where does I the mean, time go? I mean, if yeah. you're talking 18 more years of President Nelson until he's 115, he could still be around. Elder Bednar could still be around. Yeah, it's he could. But, 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 but President... It's going to be a maybe for me, but everybody yeah, else is, could, yeah. you know, a lot of people die before 88. Uh, it's a, a lot of people this, do. This is a bizarrely morbid conversation. <laughs> it right is. Now. It is. I don't mean to be so specific, but uh, and, and if yeah, I, I did feel like I hate to lean on it. I almost felt like President Ballard seemed much more slowed down than he has yes. in a previous talk. Um, yeah. yeah, well, and this, didn't he yeah. say he he? I thought I heard him say because that was one that I was I was doing something else, so I was listening. Didn't he say he had something happen to his eye while he was giving his yeah. talk? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Like, he did. That I did not hear that, or I didn't remember that. Yeah, he had uh, uh, something happened that he lost his vision for it a few up. days, and or no, he lost his vision in one eye. That's what it. Is. He, he was saying he was like he said during general conference. Yeah, he said while he said while I was speaking, yeah, I suddenly lost vision in one eye. He had macular degeneration. Yeah, so yeah. that was the first time he knew about it, but. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine you're giving a conference talk? You're looking, you're doing the shift. You're looking at the teleprompters. And and one of them just, doesn't work anymore. And just boom. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I, I made a recognized. mental note. I'm like, I want to go back and watch <laughs> the talk and see if you notice when yeah. he's like, yeah. oh boy, I, I'm blind in one if eye. There's a mo- if there's a moment. Um, yeah. If he did, he he, he hit it pretty well. Um, yeah. The, I yeah. remember that, Pat. Remember that time when uh, Elder Worthlin started kind of, it wasn't convulsing, but he like, couldn't shaking. stop shaking, shaking at the podium. Mm-hmm. I always remember that. And I always remember oh, yeah. that it was just, you know, Elder Nelson. Elder Nelson just stood up casually just quietly and just kind of steadied him and i always yeah. thought that yeah was, it was love a sweet to see moment. that yeah yeah, yeah. for sure well, i'd forgotten that that's a that's a great story it's a touching little story and about our current prophet that's a sweet story no that was really moving so and i remember so president ballard's remarks were interesting to me because they almost seemed like it was kind of like a grab bag of like the stuff i know basically is what he was talking about he talked about so he's thankful for hindsight vision other types of vision <laughs> But he spoke a lot about his mission to England, the remarkable growth we've seen since it's been nearly 10 years since lowering 
the missionary age. And he kind of leaned on what President Nelson had talked about, right? About go on a mission, like seriously go on a mission. Yeah, a lot of talk mm-hmm. or a few talks about boys need to yeah. go on those missions, which I thought was interesting. I'm not sure. Yeah, they hadn't really been beating that drum quite as heavily in recent years, but boy, they got that out with the big, the big that big, what do you call that big bass drum, right? Boom. Yes. You know, the yeah. marching band yeah. bass drum, boys go on mm-hmm. missions. That's the deal. Yeah. Yeah. So are the numbers of like, are they dropping? Is it, is it COVID related? I don't know. I'm curious. Well, Haley, since you're asking. Um, <laughs> Jeff knows everything. I don't know everything, but I enjoy stats. You know, I just like to so, throw out questions that no one yeah. has the answer. I don't know everything, but uh, when they release But he does the, have um, Google. Why well, I yes yes, I have the Google, but I also have um, they released the, the uh, statistical report mm-hmm. for the year, and it does show us something. I can see why they're pushing for this. COVID has absolutely had an impact on the number of missionaries. So we had about sixty seven thousand full time proselytizing missionaries out in twenty nineteen. Okay, that number dropped to fifty one thousand in twenty twenty. That was a twenty three percent drop in okay. the number of of full-time missionaries, which but is- But that would include some that got sent home? Yeah. Well, it, it would basically mean, I'm assuming it would mean someone's, they did release some kind of early mm-hmm. because of the COVID circumstances, mm-hmm. but it also indicates that they were just not replenishing at the same rate that they were losing people, right? Right. Because uh, I understandably, a lot of kids- They couldn't like, travel and yeah, stuff like, like that. My, my hat goes off to those who- put in their papers and serve missions willingly during COVID. I mean, oh, it's, I just, it's I, unbelievable. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like at this point we have sister, especially because we have sister missionaries in our ward. We have seen ones that have come in and out and they've spent their entire mission in mm-hmm. pandemic circumstances stances. Mm-hmm. And that's all they've known for a whole mission. Mm-hmm. And like, I admire them. I would hate that so much if I were a missionary dealing with that. Yes. Uh, so, so good for them. Uh, we rebounded a little bit in 2021. We're up to 54,000 or so missionaries, which is a slight increase, but we're still like 18% off of where we were in 2019. So Okay. So they really do have a way to go to get back to yeah. 2020. Yeah. And of course, the numbers, have, the numbers have bounced around a lot. Like 2012 <laughs> was when they dropped the, the age to 18. And that, we got a big surge then. Huge surge then. We it was went like from, we got almost to 100,000. It was 90,000 or so. Oh, let me look here. So in, tw- in 2012, we had 58,990 serving. This is October of 2012 when President Monson made the announcement to change the, the age. At, at the end of 2013, we had 83,000 missionaries serving. Tw- a 29% jump. We got all the way up to 85,000. That was the peak in 2014. And after that, it kind of like equalized after the surge effect. But it's still leveled out at like 74, 70,000. But it's been dropping. six. But it's been like in the mid to high 60s pretty consistently yeah. for a little bit. Um. So now it's a lot lower. And I'm sure the other little data point I crunched on this, though, is sort of <laughs> the percentage of missionaries as a proportion of total just global membership of the church, essentially what percentage of members of the church are on missions, which is, of course, much smaller than total membership. And that's the big number that's dropped a ton. So that is down to 0.32%. And to be clear, none of the numbers are ever above like a single percent, because imagine how many missionaries you'd have out if even 1% of right, right. the church's membership was on a mission, that'd be 168,000 missionaries at any given time. Right, right. But that number used to be much higher, like 0.55%, point, even, let's see, it got up to, yeah, it got up to like almost 0.6% after 2012. That's the one I think they're concerned about because the church numbers are growing, but a smaller proportion of yeah, yeah. those who can serve are going and are choosing to go. And so I think that's... As- as far as like um, the numbers between like men and women going, I've noticed that since they dropped the age in my ward, at least on a local level, um, it's about the same. It's about 50-50 uh, that are always, you know, men and women that are out at the same time, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I that love cool. I, I've seen I've seen the same thing, at least as far as sisters going, far more women going out because they don't feel like, you know, when you wait until you're 21, it's very easy to say, I've got like one more year of college left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's great dropping it down. I remember someone asked Elder Holland when they announced this all those years ago. They said, well, why not just drop the girls to 18 as well? And he just said one miracle at a time. That was his excuse. <laughs> so I don't know what it means, but that's fine. Um, I've seen that too, and it's been great. I love having more sisters in the field uh, compared to, uh, I don't know if we actually published those stats for how many are yeah. women versus, versus men, but that'd be good to know. know. 
So this is obviously a concern for the church. You know, our our growth rate has slowed substantially. COVID, of course, but even before COVID, the overall growth rate of the church was slowing more and more year upon year. Uh, but all these are just hard numbers, to be clear. Yeah. Like, I'd rather have 168,000 baptisms where two thirds of them are going to remain active than, you know, 300,000 baptisms and a quarter of them are going to stay active. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. well, we've all heard these stories over the decades of missions that were, and we could say recklessly baptizing people. Yeah. <laughs> there there is baptism. this n- notion in, in the church that, you know, I grew up with, right. That, you know, the church would, you know, fill North and South America and then cover the world and, 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 and I think uh, we really have this in some ways wrong. Uh, I think we look at that and feel like if we're not growing by one or two percent a year, uh, if we're not having you know serious numbers of baptisms and children, that somehow we're failing because the church isn't growing quickly enough. Mm. And and I just don't see it that way. You know, the the, the Savior talked about the members of the church basically as as the salt of the earth right and uh you know a light on a hill and and you can do that with very small numbers right so we get temples all around the world now uh, and i know you'll want to talk about that jeff but but <laughs> yeah I, I think the the fulfillment of that prophecy doesn't require us to have uh 2.4 billion members right uh um but how no. awesome would that be? <laughs> like, what do you think of that, Pope? We got I think this. everyone, the world would get a little nervous. I think yeah. that happens. So, anyway, I think I think it's just fine that the church is its growth is slowing. I, I hate to say that I'm, I'm the word mission leader now. <laughs> That's really weird for me to say, but they're really uh, looking to you for guidance. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, I'll teach a few. Oh, uh, like, we're fine. We're good. Yeah. The steak is bothering you for like baptismal goals, and you're like zero, <laughs> one, <laughs> two. Who's but you know, say? but really, honestly, part of missionary work is you know retaining the ones that yeah. you have, and so you need to strengthen yeah. them as well, and not just look for the next big thing. And our Let's, ward is doing great on missionary work, by the way. And it's not because of me, but it's sure fun to see the ward doing great on missionary work. And that's so important. I mean, I've been in places where the missionaries are able to get people baptized on the regular. But then, like, if the ward is not ready to support them in that, and if the candidates are not ready to really understand what they're doing, it just, yeah, then yeah. You're, all you're doing is just boosting up your numbers of baptisms. And you're, I, in many ways, you're like damning these people more than you would be otherwise. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I hate I to say it that way, ward. but. But yeah, that's I, oh, I saw this a lot when I was uh, living over in Scotland for grad school. Uh, I was the award, I was like the co ward mission leader there is how we did it. We had two of us, and it was a struggle. Like there were so many missionaries in our ward because there was one ward in Edinburgh, but it was also the home of the mission office. The assistants were there, all the office elders were there, and because there was one ward for the whole city, you had a lot of missionaries to cover a city of a million people, even though there's just one ward there. So there was like 16 missionaries in our ward or something like that, and you can imagine they were productive. Um, I remember once we had almost, we had it out with them because the ward could not afford to keep filling the font every single week for baptisms because they were like, they were like, it costs the ward a hundred pounds every week. Every time you do this, it costs us a hundred pounds in energy costs to fill the font. Can we please Whoa. at least do this bi-weekly instead? Oh, no. And the mission... I get it because like have having been a missionary, especially abroad, you th- you think you're the one who knows better. Like, hey, I'm I'm the North American missionary. Like, I am here to yeah. t- tell you the truth about the way the church is run, right? <laughs> um, and there was an element to that, like just the way we we duke it out. But it hurt ward morale, is what I was getting at. There were so many baptisms all the time, and the ward never it seemed like the ward never had a chance to like get to know these people yeah. and oh, understand yeah. them better and help lay the foundation for them to have mm-hmm. a strong relationship with the gospel. So it was like one in eight. That would actually mm-hmm. kind of stick around. The rest were just sort of just just being pushed through, and it was. Yeah. So I'm with you on that on that front, yeah. Devin. Like as long as we can keep yeah, the quality. I, no, I've been really um, impressed with my ward. You know, we we do our little coordination meetings, and everyone's jazzed up. Uh, you know, the members are jazzed up, and we got great missionaries. So it's it's been it's been good for me. You know, when I moved into this ward, uh, I have to tell you, when I moved into the ward like three and a half months ago, my big fear 
so so spot on. I was literally afraid they would call me to be the ward mission leader. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. uh, it's been very good to, for me to, That's good. you know, a little lesson in humility. So anyway, we should talk about general conference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's okay. I think it's okay. That's we were it. missionaries. We're we're on topic. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. You did you did mention temples, Dev. We might as well cover that right now. Yeah, go to that because I know obviously, you love to talk about that. Obviously, we are always everyone's excited. We're all very accustomed to the Nelson era of not just even like a few temples being announced. I remember when President Monson was in. That's when we kind of got in this cadence where there'd be like seven to nine temples announced every conference. And I got to that <laughs> point. If you remember, President Monson once said, "We've announced a lot of temples." We're, we're hitting the brakes this time around. I'm not announcing anything new. We want to focus on the ones we're trying to get in development. I never expect that from President Nelson. I think President no. Nelson is just like, nope, nope, nope. I know. Nope, I nope. always like turn the page to like a fresh page in my notebook. I'm like, okay, I need a whole, all the lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so so here we are, of course. And I almost wondered if he was actually going to do that this time because in his at the end of his remarks, he kind of let off and said, we've announced many temples. We're considering how, I forgot his verbiage, but he basically said like, yeah. we're considering how many of these are in development. I thought he might say, we've got to, we don't want to have to let the backlog be too significant, but no, no, no. Yeah. It was, like, a, it was a real twist. There. <laughs> yeah. I would, yeah. He, he faked me out there with that little move. He's, he's, he's nasty. Oh, I got to fix the article. Kind of juked us. Oops, this tells you this this tells you about writers, by the way. I'd pre-written an article and it's I forgot to edit this. It says he closed the conference by announcing XX temples in the following locations. I'm supposed oh. to put a number there. Oops, boo-boo on Jeff. Oopsie. But he announced 17, 17 temples, everybody, which is a number that cracks me up only because in we learned last year President Nelson had announced more temples than any other per- church president in history. And as of the October conference. He only needed to announce 17 temples to get to having announced 100 temples during his tenure. So, whoa, I'm not one to say the way the Lord works, <laughs> but part of it makes me laugh. Like, is this like you were feeling 16 and thought there could be an extra one we could chuck on there because he was a nice round 100? You're not the only one who likes stats. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I just thought that was kind of, it just, it, as you read through all of them, I was like, that's 17. They're actually, I was laughing, like before conference, when we did our temple predictions, we were kind of laughing, like, let's see if he announces 17 temples. Oh my and gosh. Yeah, there we go. Um, so temples announced, yes, many, many temples here. So Wellington, New Zealand, which is going to put three temples on the North Island of New Zealand, still not one down on the South Island near Christchurch, but Wellington's the capital of New Zealand. It's on the Southern part of the Big Island. Uh, Brazzaville, Republic of the Congo, which we talked about in our temple predictions, if you want to know really, really useless stats here, and I know you do, okay. for, for our listeners who might not be as international relations inclined, um, there's a Republic of the Congo and there's the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Oh. They are separate countries. That's largely just a, res- a vestige of colo- just European colonialism. Republic, right. Republic of the Congo was a, um, a French colony and Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is also known as Zaire, was a Belgian colony. And so even though they're right next to each other on the Congo River and they have the same basic name, there you go. So, well, and there's an important distinction too, yeah. I would just add, that the Republic of the Congo is, relatively speaking, thriving, growing, prospering. The Democratic, the DRC is a mess. The DRC it's, has a lot of eth- interethnic strife. It's arguably the, yeah. the the poorest country in the world. Oh. They've got th- there's some issues, but we have uh, what two temples in? The, we've got a temple in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Yeah. Another one coming uh, elsewhere is in the country as well, or if, I think two actually. We got one in Lubumbashi, Lubumbashi, and one in Kanenga, I think. That's great. But, the fun stat is that the capital cities of each country sit across the Congo River from one another. They're the most closely located sovereign capital cities in the entire world. There you go, folks. You can wow. use that your, at, at, at like Look at, at work that. or a, a pub quiz, something like that. Yeah, because we're all at the pub quizzes on Friday nights. And there <laughs> is no, yes, and there's no bridge connecting the two, which is kind of funny. They're talking about that. But they sit across the river from one another, and they're not connected in any way other than by ferry. But so this will also mean that each city will have a temple, and it'll mean you'll have temples located in capital, the two capital cities closest to each other in the world, if that's a metric that matters for anybody. Will those two uh, temples end up, I guess we don't know where the new temple will be, but it'll be inter- interesting to see if they are the closest temples. 
Well, at least for there's like, some so, closed like, temples in Utah. For separate nations, I would assume, because I don't think they're going to be closer than like the Ochre Mountain and the South Jordan temples or anything like that. You well, know? Ochre Mountain and South Jordan are like ten miles apart. If there's just a river between them. All right. Anyway, well, we're going to figure we'll figure this out. Yeah, we need to comes. we need to pay attention to this, Jeff. Okay. So in six right. years, when it's done, we got to come back and finish. Okay, this Devin, we're half an hour in, and I've only read two temples. We got to get through. This. <laughs> So, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, other one I'm super psyched about, Barcelona, Spain. We talked about in our predictions. That's Yay. so great for me. I served my mission in Barcelona. I'm very excited about that. That's I, awesome. I knew you'd be happy about that one. That's that's just uh, good stuff there. I don't want to nerd out too much about it, but that's I, I did not know if I'd see the day, and I just want to personally thank all of the Peruvian immigrants that basically hold the church up in that part of the world. So thank you, immigrants from Latin America, for letting the church grow in Spain. So it's not the Spanish or the Catalan people who are doing it in mass. That's cool. Uh, Birmingham, United Kingdom, that's kind of interesting. We thought maybe a temple would go up in Scotland, but that'll be the third temple in England. Um, so that'll be great. Uh, Cusco, Peru, very cool. Uh, Maceo, Brazil. Santos, Brazil. Then San Luis Potosi, Mexico. Also, Mexico City, Benemer, uh, Benemeritu. Uh, I know how to speak Spanish. What am I doing? Benemerito. Thank you. Um, that one's significant because Benemerito is where the church ran a high school for a long time. But they only closed a couple of years ago. I am guessing that campus is what will become a temple instead. Mm. Uh, Tampa, Florida. I'm sure all your Yay. compatriots in Jacksonville were like, come on, Devin. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're excited now. We're, we're going to have three temples in Florida. That's pretty exciting. No, you're going to have four. <laughs> oh, that's right. We're building one in Tallahassee too. So yeah, yeah. Uh, my brother was my brother served his mission in Knoxville, Tennessee. So he's very excited about the temple being announced there, which does fill a really big like hole in the map. If you look at where the, the that area of the yeah, world I wondered is about lined. that. They're yeah. either there's the king like the Kingsport Stake, which is in Tennessee on the border with Virginia, is assigned to a temple in South Carolina. And then Knoxville and Chattanooga are assigned to Nashville and like everything in between, like Asheville goes down to South Carolina. It's kind of a, there's a big hole right there. So that's cool. Uh, Cleveland, which Ohio, which is great. Old Kirtland territory. I just want to note that Corey Ward, one of our buddies sent me a, a picture that said the church's own press release talked about the history around Cleveland, which is of course Kirtland, right? Kirtland is mm-hmm. nearby, except they wrote Kirkland, i.e. Costco. And um, <laughs> got to fix that. Kirkland. But I've been, but I've been there too. Uh, <laughs> last four, uh, oh no, last five. Wichita, Kansas. That's when we talked about our predictions. Austin, Texas. We did predict in our predictions. That's great. Uh, Missoula, Montana. Didn't know if they'd get one after the temple was announced in Helena, but the, they've got that one going. Montpelier, Idaho. When President Nelson started saying Montpelier, at first I thought he was going to say Vermont. You know, but no. Montpelier, Idaho is basically the Cache Valley side of Idaho, just off Bear oh. Lake. It's that neck of the woods. And okay. then good old Modesto, California, Central yeah. Valley represent. Awesome. So a yeah. lot, of, lot of temple action happening going around. That's I'm cool. sure they yeah. will come in various sizes and dimensions. And that'll be fun. So good job, President Nelson. Good job, temple people. <laughs> Do any of these temples excite any of you more than others? I was really hoping for a temple in Colorado Springs, Haley. That was one thing I called for, but it did not. <sighs> yeah. Pass. Oh, well, alas. Yeah. I was excited for Tampa. You're like, I don't care. I live near the temple in Denver. I'm good. I'm like, like five, 10 minutes. I'm good. Whatever they need. <laughs> yeah, this is good is stuff. It? It's pretty cool to see how this is. I, I like It becomes increasingly difficult to predict where a temple might go because President Nelson's just letting them go up in all kinds of locales at this point. No, I think it's very cool. It's, so, yeah. um Talks. Which which talk, who wants to lead off with any talk that was meaningful, influential, something? I have a on. I have a list of several, but uh, <laughs> I, like the Devin I don't want to hawk. I talk too much. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. Okay, so so I think there's uh, yeah. Well, let me talk about one. So uh, Elder Kieran uh, spoke, mm. and I I think his talk will be the talk from this conference that is most read fifty or a hundred years from now. Oh. His talk he, was historic. Yeah. It will wow. be read and quoted forever. Yeah. Uh, it will save lives. It will change the world. It was significant. But Elder Kieran talked about how victims of sexual assault are not guilty of sin. Now, we would all say, well, of course not. That's obvious. When was the last time someone said this in general conference? To the best of my recollection, no one's ever said this as profoundly, mm. as clearly, as 
enthusiastically as he did and talk about wounded hearts that need to be touched. He did just a perfect job of that. And like I say, people will quote this talk oftentimes in private conversations uh, forever. And and they'll pass this around in in groups of people who will read it tearfully and cope, help, help them cope with horrible, horrible experiences. Uh, And I'm so grateful for that. So that that was one of my favorites. Yeah. I think it might've been the, to me, it was probably like the talk of the conference. Like of all the ones I remember the most, I think that one stuck out. Um, I like the way we framed it too. We talked about survival stories, HMS endurance, which we just saw in the news in the past month, right? They found the, the ship. Apollo 13. And he talked about survival of families victimized by war. There was a lot of er allusions to the situation in Ukraine without naming it for a little while. Um, And I didn't think he limited his remarks to sexual abuse necessarily. It seemed to me he was talking about just abuse. That was part of it. But yeah, just abuse in general. I mean, I love that he said no one is ever asking for aggression. And you could absolutely, how many times have you heard that when it comes to something like sexual abuse, that they were asking for it? Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. Oh, some of the things that uh, we say to victims or some have, have traditionally been said and some of the things that uh, the way we behave in the church, um, you know, the BYU Honor Code Office is has become infamous for uh, getting young women mostly uh, in trouble with their bishops uh, after they've been victimized. Uh and it's just wrong thinking. And so it was great to hear him talk about that. Uh, yeah. it was a, it was a very, I, I hope we'll all take it fully to heart. Agreed. Yeah, I can't wait to read that one again. If there's a, like, if there's such a thing as a short list in the upper ups for uh, future apostles when there's vacancies, I have to assume he's on it. That's all. <laughs> yeah. If such I, a had thing that exists, I had that thought too. If such a thing yeah. exists, I think. <laughs> Um, I remember Elder Holland spoke right before him. By the way, I love their yeah. little playful banter. Oh, their jokes were so mm-hmm. funny. That, that, was, that was very funny. It's funny because I didn't like get a ton of notes directly about Elder Holland's remarks, actually. The, the funny thing is I remember he talked about you know the joke about conference being boring, but what's kind of yeah. funny is he didn't actually spend his remarks explaining why conference was not boring. He just kind of had a laugh about yeah. a girl thinking Yeah, which was, was great. It was the funniest joke of the Which was hilarious. But sure. I was also like, are you going to prove to this girl that conference is not boring? <laughs> no, he just he I'm, said, no. my name is Patrick Kieran and moved yeah. on. <laughs> which, was, which was pretty darn funny. That was, that yeah. was really good. <laughs> so yeah, he, he just used that setup just for the joke. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. had nothing to do with great. his talk. <laughs> yeah, Except he did great. say he was talking to the youth, but not necessarily the little kids. But yeah, but his talk was one of my favorites. It really yeah. was. Um, he said something that struck me as the most important thing. Well, that, I'm going to say it, I'm going to rank them. For me personally, it was the second most important thing in the conference. But he was talking about how uh, some members have difficulty with some part of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I frankly think it's not some members. Personally, I think almost all members. There's there's a cheerleader subset, tiny group that have no problem with anything. They love everything the church does, never have a question, never have a doubt. The rest of us struggle with some things and some of it's not very big. We don't struggle much, but but we struggle with, you know, we got questions like, why, why did Joseph Smith lie about practicing polygamy? Why did he marry a 14-year-old girl? You know, the, I mean, there are questions that people have. So he said, if you are troubled by something, stay in the church. Stay around. We want you here. Even yeah. if you don't like the broccoli, stay for the meal. Stay for the whole yeah. banquet. Yeah. And I don't remember all his language, but that it really struck me as an important message because I, the way I interpreted it personally was even if you have doubts, that's normal. That's fine. We want you in the church, not out of the church. You're welcome in full fellowship. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You're not messed up. You're not to be set aside. You're one of us. You're in, join us, stay with us. You're cool. It's all good. And maybe I exaggerate, but that's the way that statement really hit me. Uh, and so I loved that. I thought that was really an important talk. Yeah. And I always like it when they ad- address like really difficult topics, like head on, like suicide. 
And yeah. it's oh, like instead of, you know, yeah. just like kind of tiptoeing around it, you know, just the more they get comfortable, like, you know, discussing those topics, then the more we have tools that we can use to help others. And, and I was really glad that he did not, you know, morally condemn suicide. Uh, because when I grew up, that was the reason not to commit suicide. Well, that would make your heavenly father sad, or that would, you know, you couldn't get into it's the celestial sin. kingdom if you committed yeah. suicide. You, you had, you had right? committed murder. Just That's what they would say, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he didn't go there, and I was so glad he didn't go there. And all the, uh, to me, he said all the right things. Uh, so, uh, yes, I appreciated his remarks on suicide as well. And the church, I mean, the church officially changed its position essentially on that a few years ago. I don't know exactly when, but we've we have changed our tune big time on that and said like we don't understand the circumstances. Uh, we don't know what's going through someone's head emotionally, but we've stressed that like suicide is not a one way door to damnation. Yeah, um, I I because I remember the same the... thing growing up. I was always told like, dude, no. Well, even do so you remember? Selfish. I think it was even Holland's talk back in the day of souls, symbols, and sacraments that, yeah. do you guys remember that? Where he talks about the two, like one of the two most important things the Heavenly Father is concerned with is how we get into this life and how we get out of it. And so kind of saying like, those are the two, you know, worst sins is kind of what it was implying. So it's kind of interesting to see like the difference also yeah. from that time versus, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I had the um, opportunity to speak there was a bishop in my stake that eight weeks after, seven weeks after he was released as a bishop, he killed himself. Wow. Oh. And uh, our stake president, whom I love deeply, was not able to attend. And he asked me to to go and speak. Wow. And you can imagine there's a little bit of pressure speaking to this congregation that's just lost uh, its recent bishop uh, to suicide. And so, yes, uh, I was I felt that personal connection to Elder Holland's remarks yeah. as well from that standpoint that he didn't uh, bring up the suicide as a sin kind of message because the the ward members struggled with that a lot. Um, so it was good. Yeah. I, I found there was an interesting thread across a few talks. There was a, there was a big theme kind of on the Lord's will being done, the Lord's timing. Yeah. Uh, and a few talks, two that stuck out at me were from uh, this morning on Sunday morning, Deacon Todd Christofferson and then Amy A. Wright, the second counselor in the primary general presidency, kind of back to back had different, they spoke about different facets of this, but it was the same idea that, um, you know, our time of suffering, like for Elder Christofferson, we might feel that God has abandoned us when we suffer. Some think that oh, supposed obedience to God means fixed outcomes on a specific schedule, on a specific scale, like it's very transactional in that sense. I like that he even called out. He's like, some may think if they refrain from schoolwork on the Sabbath, God will bless them with good grades. And like, I am one of those people who I tried to avoid doing schoolwork on the Sabbath. Yeah, I'm like, I did that in college. <laughs> yeah, to make it a different day. I don't know if I took it as far and said like, I know this thing is due tomorrow, but it's Sunday. So... You know, I don't think I took it quite to that level, but, and also like if we pay our tithing, we'll get a high paying job, which leans a little bit like more into the prosperity doctrine, which we don't believe in as Latter-day Saints. Um, I like that he stressed so much that like we go through trials, we try to be obedient. It does not mean that we set the terms. It does not mean that we set the timetable. It's it, like he said, God's plan is not a cosmic vending machine, which was <laughs> uh, fantastic verbiage to hear in general conference. To whoever decided to say cosmic vending machine and work that, it's like, it's, that's the kind of thing like they dared him to. I want to thank Elder Gong sat there and was like, work cosmic vending machine into your remarks, Todd. See if you can get that line. <laughs> um, it was a dare in a text. <laughs> it was a dare. Um, also, the name of my ska band at one point, cosmic vending machine. So. <laughs> But I love this. And Amy Wright spoke about kind of the same thing. She talked about like we can spend a long time waiting on the Lord. Like we, uh, her one line, this is paraphrased, but she said, you know, our focus on deliverance from trials should be less on the way we are delivered and more on who provides the deliverance, right? Keep our focus on the Savior. So I thought, and I think these weren't the only two talks that dealt on that, but there was definitely this sort of theme running through of mm -hmm. like be obedient, have faith, write it out, but understand that the way you see that you are doing things like I'm doing X, Y, Z, so I'll receive ABC 
is not necessarily the way God works. And it might not happen when you think it's going to happen. Um, and I just, I appreciate reminders like that a lot in our lives. I think it's very easy to be transactional in the gospel and it's very easy to be prescriptive as Latter-day Saints and expect that if I do these certain things, these are the exact blessings I should expect, but it, God doesn't necessarily work like that way. You know, you could be a full tithe payer and struggle with, with, steady employment, like for years, for decades, even that could be like a thing that's just a challenge for you your whole life. Um, and so these are, these are just good humbling reminders. And I think just to yeah. be patient, it's, I think it's very easy to grow impatient with God because you feel like you're doing everything right. Well, doing yeah. Right. And there's so many general conference talks that we do here where, you know, Sally did this and then this happened, this miracle happened, or, you yeah. know, they mm-hmm. <laughs> made this sacrifice and then they got this blessing. Whereas, you know, 90% of us, it doesn't work that way. You know, like you, things go wrong and things happen and you fail and, you know, mess up and you're not always, yeah. you don't always see that right away or the person does die or the miracle doesn't come, you know? And so you still have to find ways to maintain and build, keep building that trust and that forward focus. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, t- side note, footnote, uh, sister Wright is not married to a brother, Wright. Uh, she did not take her husband's name. Her husband oh is, gosh. uh, Jim McConkey, who was called into the quorum of the, uh, first quorum of the 70, right? Oh, I saw that. Was that Jim Are they a power McConkie couple? The you, you, third? Yeah. There's quite a few these days, right? Yeah. That's interesting. I have often wondered, especially for the um, the sisters who are these in these general officer callings, like when, the the path to getting there. I'm just intrigued by that because I get it. Like when you're a man, we'll try. Let's try to dispense with all of the patriarchal stuff. But when you're a man, there's not a path necessarily. But maybe having that level of visibility has somewhat kind of more of a natural progression in a way. Like you might be a bishop at some point, which put you on the radar of a stake presidency or and if you're a stake president, you're on the radar of area authority. You know how it can be. Mm-hmm. But there, there's not like a, a direct parallel all the time for women, especially when you get into upper levels of church leadership. So I've always just been intrigued by how they oh. are known. Like we just found we're getting a new Relief Society presidency and a new primary presidency. Mm-hmm. And I'm just and, curious about like how these sisters know each other, how they know to call who they want to have called to be their counselors and things like that. It's a whole area that just, fascinates me. And, uh, and I I, I'm about. totally wrong, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I apologize. <laughs> her, her husband's her husband's name is James McConkie Wright. So. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. okay. So. <laughs> but there's the McConkie. Get it. Yeah. All so the I apologize. Yeah. Uh, you gotta just I, edit that whole thing out. Maybe you could, maybe Jeff, when you're done, you can just edit out everything no. I say and there'd be no. no record that I was here at all. That, that might make for a better episode. Um, um, according to like th- their bios that I'm looking at, um, on the newsroom site, a lot of them serve on like the Relief Society General Advisory Council yeah. or the Young Women General Advisory Council before. So, I mean, I'm sure they all meet together at, you know, different times and that. <laughs> I, mean, I, hope that I hope that makes sense. I'm just yeah curious how you wind up being on the radar in those sorts of positions compared to other ones. That's all. I think it's uh, intriguing. Yeah. And speaking of some of the new sisters, I think it's fascinating that because Sister um, Johnson, who's going to be the new Relief Society president, has barely been in the primary presidency. So I think it's interesting to see the Lord's hand at work there, almost saying like, yeah, we need you... Not that primary is not important, but we need you to be, <laughs> we need you here now uh, instead. But one of her counselors is Sister Yi, runs the animation team. For yeah, the I church, saw that. Which is so cool. I think that's just She worked super for Disney previously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. So I just think that's super cool. Uh, I'm also intrigued why they're waiting until August. I don't have any memory of that happening in the past of saying we are changing this up like we should. We're expected to do so. Yeah. Every, it's been five years for the Relief Society, but they're not doing it till August one. No idea <laughs> what's smart. driving in our, behind that. In curious. our ward, it's always like you got to get through girls' camp. Then you, can, <laughs> <laughs> you can't put in someone new before girls' camp. You're uh, already planning it. But I'm sure that it's not that. <laughs> no, these, are big, these these are big responsibilities, and having a having some transition time sure makes sense to me. I think it's great. Yeah, I'm just intrigued by it. I'm going to miss, uh, I think the current General Relief Society presidency has been uh, extremely influential yeah. in ways that 
people don't always realize. I think they've they've done some phenomenal work in the five years they've been in. I will miss Sister Bingham. I will miss Sister Eubank immensely. Oh yeah, and she's Sister she's Abdosa. a rock star in my they've, mind. They've yeah. all been yeah. just, just fantastic. It's uh, uh, we're very very fortunate to have had them hanging out with us for yeah. the past little while. And I I loved uh, Sister. Well, I liked Sister Alberto's talk about how yeah. she basically said the church is the members and that we all you know have an impact and. I think, I don't know. I just, I like that. I just like focusing. I like talks when they focus on, you know, just us doing our best, you know, and not necessarily like just the organization as a whole, which can sometimes be flawed, but yeah, just the individuals on the ground, just doing the best they can in their sphere of influence. And it's, that's very inspiring to me Um, because otherwise sometimes I'd be inclined to be like, you know, you hear that you like it's, it's don't it's not the people it, the go, the gospel is is about Christ. Just don't focus on the people. But then to actually yeah. hear, no, let's look at the people. Like there are good people doing awesome things and making their contributions everywhere. Yeah, my favorite talk of the whole conference, if I may, and I don't mean to cut you oh, off. No, but you but uh, it was Michael Ringwood, Elder Michael Ringwood, spoke this morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is good because I have me, no notes from that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I've got his name right here. <laughs> and part of it, I, I think part of the reason there's no notes is that so little of what he said was new. Yeah. Um, but he remember, he's the one that talked about how y- you never go to a, uh, a sporting event where someone isn't holding up a sign that says John 316. And of course, that is the famous that verse of scripture that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Great, great, great scripture. Hot so take. incredibly important. I'll take from Devin. <laughs> and, and it is sort of the, uh, I, I think it's sort of, sort of the evangelical Christians that like to really uh, drive that message home. But then, uh, he he took went on and he said, "Let's read the next verse." And this verse is so incredibly important, and no one ever reads it. I mean, I say no one. Of course, we all read it when we read it. But but yeah. he called attention to the next verse, and 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 to me, this just made the whole gospel more meaningful to hear him talk about it in general conference. He said, "For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world." but that the world through him might be saved. And there are so many conference talks where I think members of the church feel like they've been rebuked again. They feel like in a way they have been condemned yet again because they don't measure up. And I thought for the rest of my life, I am going to filter every word I hear from any conference talk I'm going to say, okay, first, let's look at it through John 3.17. And, you know, God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And now, if we look at it through that lens, what does it mean? It just provided this super powerful new frame for seeing the whole gospel plan laid out. I was so excited. I loved that talk. You can tell I get a little bit excited, but it really was important to me. Wow, I love that. That's awesome. Thanks. I'm going to revisit it now. I don't know. I, I had kid distractions or something. That one didn't. So thanks. Well, man. you know, I, I, I say it was incredibly important to me, but, you know, the, the rest of you know, his talk was ordinary. It was typical, but it was so incredibly profound. It was my favorite yeah. talk by far of the whole conference. Well, and that's the beauty of conference, right? It's like like all spiritual pursuits. It's very easy to like take lots of notes about what they say which like mm-hmm. I'm absolutely guilty of doing, especially for the sake of the podcast. But it's really about like what we take away that speaks to us that's influential. Like I think, Devin, there's probably plenty of people who heard that talk and they might not have thought much else about yeah, it. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's fine. I, and I'm not surprised but, in a way because, fine. you know, it was it was gospel 101 in a way. Yeah. But, 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 but for but it you. Hit me like yeah. PhD level theology. So yeah. it was great. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's that's why I love doing this because now after hearing your thoughts, I'm really excited to go back and read that and 
look at that because again, I get so distracted when I'm listening. I'm a visual <laughs> learner. And yeah. so I'm like in one ear out the other. So that's a great observation. It is funny with something like conference too. I mean, like I take notes because we want to talk about the content of the talks and they're not published yet. Right. But like, especially for something like general conference, I mean, the talks are published in a matter of days. Like, you don't, you yeah. don't need the text as much as you need the impressions and what it means to you and what is, what is potent and, and powerful. I was in a meeting years and years ago, Elder Bednar was in our stake or some neighboring stake or something like that. So I went to some kind of like a YSA, this was a long time ago. So a YSA meeting with Elder Bednar. Um, and I remember one of the first things he said, cause everyone's sitting there with their notebooks, ready to write down every utterance that comes from his lips, whatever it might be. But he said very clearly, he's like, you're going to be tempted to try to like, just write down everything I say. Cause you want a record of this experience. Right. But he's like, don't do that. Write down what the spirit tells you and the impressions mm -hmm. you get. Don't worry about the content because that's totally like immaterial when all is said and done here. And I've still been guilty of doing that, but I've, that's always like sat with me and, and struck me and something I've, yeah. I've leaned on. Also, I didn't worry about it as much at the time because my buddy was surreptitiously recording the audio, which you're not supposed to do, but <laughs> there we go. Um, um, actually, so every I'm uh, serving as uh, second counselor in the young women's presidency in my ward right now. And for the past, however many conferences I've been in there, six or four to six, I don't know. Um, I have the younger class, 12 to 13 year olds. And we do, we did this the first time we did the, like this conference recap where they were just supposed to come prepared to talk about their favorite talk from conference. And we would, you know, yeah. talk about it around a fire. One time it was I don't know, raining. So we had like, we made like a fake fire inside. It was cute. But um, I'm always amazed. We, we kept doing it because it's just such a great activity and they love it. And I'm always amazed at how each one of them has a completely like different take on some aspect. And they're, and they're not just like these superficial observations that they have. They're like, oh, I like this because it's about families. No, they have these real meaningful um, takeaways that apply to their lives directly. And it's so cool to hear. And th they bring up things I that never occurred to me when I was listening. And so that's why I like to keep doing it, just to hear like what different people get out of different talks. Yeah. I do love the youth of today. I don't know. I look back on when I was a youth and I'm like, I wasn't thinking about stuff like this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> What? I know they'll one of uh, they'll like they'll like type it out. They'll have like a, they'll stand up, have it like typed out. Well, I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have been like, yeah, I like that we're supposed to read our yeah. scriptures. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, I was <laughs> I'd be sitting there on the couch with my mom smacking me, telling me not to keep, stop falling, keep you know, don't fall asleep, get it together, Jeff. Get yeah. Um, let's see some other talks. What can I jump to here that was of interest? Uh, Elder Bednar's was interesting. He talked about the power of music, law of the words for let us all press on. I did note, I know it's like a, let's get up and go and be like the Lord's army sort of kind of a song. Though I did kind of laugh that when there was all these references to like peace in Ukraine and violence and war. And then like this verse is like, bring your sword. Da, 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 da. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but, but that's okay. But yeah. So, so this was for me, one thing that jumped out at me. He talked about things that can help us deal with scorn and oppression. He talked about how we can weather the condemnation of the world and people not liking us or mocking us or any of these sorts of things. And it, Many people of faith have to deal with that. Obviously, we are not, that's not a new area to us as Latter day Saints. We are a peculiar people, after all. But the first two things he lists off, he says scripture study, fervent prayer. And that's what you can be like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, expected answer. But the third thing he said was proper preparation to participate in the sacrament. Like that was up there at that same level of things we do to deal with scorn and oppression and be able to weather the storms. That was just very interesting to me. When I'm thinking about like, because I know I do not do a good enough job preparing for the sacrament. I try to be in a nice, like calm place. But I, I think I can say, along with many other fellow members of the church, that a lot of the times I'm just kind of showing up at church and we do the sacrament. Maybe I'll take some time and like say a little prayer afterwards or read some scriptures while I'm doing it. But like, am, how rarely am I actually taking time to be in like proper preparatory mode for the taking of the sacrament? Um, and may, I'm, I'm hoping there's some of you listening who are thinking like, dude, Jeff, of course you do that. We all, we all do this, Jeff, come on. Um, but that, that really struck me as he was lifting that up to that level of importance in terms of things we can do to be strong mm -hmm. against oppression. 
Um, and it made me want to think about what can I do to make the sacrament more meaningful to prepare for that uh, in my life. So that was the main thing that jumped out at me that I wrote down really quickly. I thought that was just such an interesting bit of insight there. Yeah, the the that's cool. Actually, at one point, someone had recommended just bringing like a little notebook or something. I mean, I guess we all have our phones. I like yeah. just like yeah. regular <laughs> old fashioned paper just to like have during the sacrament. And then for things that pop, like impressions, like you're talking about when, was it yeah. Bednar that told you to just write down your impressions just that come to you like during sacrament. And I thought, oh, that is actually something that I can do. That's an actionable <laughs> item that is not too hard to pull off to just bring a little thing. Yeah. What do we think about uh, Elder Anderson this time around? I think he's proved to be a little more controversial in some circles in recent years. You know, he talked about focused on the name of the church. He gave that abortion talk. I thought this one was a little bit more in the lane, I guess we could say, as in I don't think it's got people buzzing too much on Twitter uh, about anything. He, he kind of, My notes are interesting. He talked about the powerful impact of the internet as a blessing and a challenge. Oh, yeah. Um, I did think this one insight was kind of interesting only because I've seen, there's been some chatter in, in recent weeks online kind of resurrecting. Uh, there's an old talk by then Elder Nelson about God's love not being unconditional. But I've read some good pieces explaining what that should actually mean when they're saying it's it's, it's about translations from the scriptures. We talked about it on the show a couple of weeks ago. But the idea is not that God's love is unconditional. It's that God's like approval and his blessings are con- are conditional on us keeping the commandments. That's what the scriptures translate to. But I thought it was interesting because he said that like, yes, we are all the offspring of God, but it is through obedience, through covenants that we become his children. And I thought that was kind of in parallel to that idea of like God's love in the actual way you define it in the scriptures that like if we have God's approval, if we have God's blessings in that sense, we are more his children than his mere offspring. So I thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing that I wrote down. I don't know. Anybody else? No. Yeah. I I, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I shouldn't, parse of an apostle's comments, but I wouldn't want to minimize uh, in any way, shape or form our native divinity, right? As, as children of God, Uh, we sing almost every week somewhere. uh, I'm a child of God. Uh, That is the true doctrine. And it doesn't, it's not because we've been baptized. Um, We become I think doctrinally, the children of Christ through taking on covenants. We are the children of our Heavenly Father because we are the children of our Heavenly Father. I think that's the correct doctrine. And that may be what he was trying to say, but I I would never want to minimize that. Um, I was speaking this week with a preacher from another religion. Uh, He and I were chatting. He's a member of the LGBTQ community. He was talking about his outreach to members of the LGBTQ community. And one of the things that he says that is sort of profoundly important to him is that he recognizes the spark of the divine in himself. And that helps him to cope with the slings and arrows of of life and the, the, the crap that he has to deal with. And he encourages the, the young people he ministers to, to see in themselves that divine. And, and I think that is a profound and important principle uh, that I wouldn't ever want to take away from anyone just because they hadn't been baptized or made all the right covenants or even kept them. We don't lose our, our relationship to God uh, by anything we do. Yeah, that's We the are one. his children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. End of story. Yeah, that's the one thing that can never be taken away. From yeah. us. And, and I feel like as a young women's leader, that is the only, if they learn nothing else, that is the only thing that I want them to leave knowing is that they are daughters of heavenly parents and that they are loved. And I think that is like, that's the foundation for everything to be able to have confidence t- to do anything, to believe, to trust, to love, to hope. Yeah, well, Haley, that's a that's a good segue. Heavenly parents. Um, <laughs> okay. We're, so, we're no, no. doing it. <laughs> well, we might as well. I thought this, so. In recent weeks, you might have seen. So, there's been a lot of chatter on social media about. Um, listen to our previous podcast. In recent weeks, we talked about it, but 
there's been some chatter that there was allegedly a training in Utah where they spoke at length about like not like things about related to Heavenly Mother, not speculating too much about her, not praying to her, a number of different items. So there are many who have feared like that there some kind of a boom was going to be lowered during general conference about this issue. Uh, and so during the women's meeting, which had some outs, I thought every talk was solid across the board. Um, we can get into some of that because we were talking before we started recording, like what was up with President Oaks's remarks <laughs> getting into it. But at the very end of it, uh, Elder Renlund came up. He was the sort of the final speaker, the capstone, if you will, just Elder Renlund. And he spoke about just the divine nature of women. But he did wade into this a little bit about, about Heavenly Mother. I've been very curious about people's thoughts on this. Uh, we even put it on our Twitter, just simply saying, okay, Elder, Elder Renlund got into this. So what did everyone think? Like, and, and comments kind of ran the gamut. Uh, some who were disappointed, some who were indifferent. But the main thing is, he said, because he said, he said, okay, look, let's talk about Mother in Heaven. He's like, it's summarizing the Gospel Topics essay. He's like, once you've read that, you'll know everything that I also know about the subject. He said, quote, I wish I knew more. Knew more. You too may still have questions and want to find answers. Seeking greater understanding is an important part of our spiritual development, but please be cautious. Reason cannot replace revelation. Um, and then he went on to explain, like, we've been taught by Christ. We pray to the Father in his name, not Heavenly Mother. He touched on some of these things that people have mentioned. Um, I was surprised that he was actually that direct. I thought, it, if anything, it'd be mm-hmm. more oblique references if this came up, as it often is in conference, just kind of hinting at the thing that we all know they're talking about. So, so this was interesting to me. Um, yeah, obviously I like, I'm sympathetic absolutely to the women who yearn for a greater relationship with heavenly mother and a greater understanding of her. I think that's really important. I don't like experience that at that same level personally, but I'm by no means discounting the feelings people have about that. So I am curious from, you know, you two, if you saw, watch this, if you read it, whatever, what, what you thought about this? Did Elder Renlund kind of, did he balance it out pretty well and he was straightforward and caring? Was it something else? I don't know. What did you guys think? I thought it was a, a bummer to have that in, in women's conference in a way. Um, because it, it felt like it was pointed directly at the sisters when the, the of course the principle applies equally to men. Uh, and it was the last talk of the conference. And because that was the memorable point he made, I think it, it felt like there was this kind of negative end to that session of conference um, for me. Uh, and I think for, for sisters for whom this has never been a question, right? That, that, that they're thrilled to know they've got a mother in heaven. They pray happily to their father in heaven and never second guess that protocol. Um, that, that, that would not be viewed as a negative thing. But to those sisters who are struggling to find uh, a place in the church with, with its priesthood structure that is gendered and, and, all, and all these issues, I think to them, this it, it was probably kind of a negative feeling. Uh, I can't argue with the doctrine. Uh, I, w- I would only suggest that, you know, in the Book of Mormon, when the Savior is teaching the principle of prayer, uh, the folks with him, as he's teaching some of these principles, begin to pray to him. And the Savior explains to his father, you know, I'm here. And so they're praying to me, you know, cut him some slack. And that experience suggests to me that, that yes, the, the protocol is to pray to the Father, uh, but maybe it's not the end of the world uh, to violate that protocol either. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know. Anyway, but, but that's, like you're that's saying, kind you, of a, even the Savior kind of saw that as a corrective opportunity, though, right? He's saying like cut him some slack, yeah. but this is not the standard. So well, and so now, I, that we've both, now that we've mansplained, oh no, it's fine. Yeah, actually, no, no, I. I'm not, I can't speak for everyone. I just, for me, I feel like, like the, I, the idea of praying to Heavenly Mother is, isn't necessarily like the issue. I feel like the greater issue is, well, especially when we're told many, many times over and over again, that gender is such a divine, eternal characteristic. Well, how are we supposed to know more about our divine, you know, <laughs> characteristics of womanhood. If we don't have the chance to learn as much as we can about like the most divine feminine influence or, you know, presence, um, our heavenly mother. And so I think that's a real, you know, yearning 
understandably for a lot of women, if you've grown up, just always been told like, oh, you have very specific um, things that are unique to you because you're a woman that are eternal. And so that's, that's really the only <laughs> idea of a person yeah. that we have to seek those, you know, what does that mean to be yeah. that? And that's yeah, the thing. And, and I have to, you know, I, I, it would seem to me that the men in the church who, who do all of this, including myself, we don't feel in general the same compelling desire for that understanding because we have role models that we relate to in the mm-hmm. Savior and in our Heavenly Father and in the apostles and prophets <laughs> and the Scripture. I mean, just, yeah. We're just loaded with all these examples. And so we probably aren't feeling in the same way that desire. And so mm-hmm. it's yeah. important, I think, for mm-hmm. for everyone to be a little more uh, patient and kind and uh, to employ a little more empathy to try and understand how sisters in the church may be feeling. So I appreciate and that's the, and, and that's the most important thing. I, I do think it's interesting when he, he'll say something like, um, you know, I wish I knew more too. You may still have your mm-hmm. questions. It's interesting to me when an apostle is saying, you know, I wish I knew more too. I think the easy, even flippant response is, well, you're in a, you're a prophet. Can you, can you know? And he, he said later in his remarks, he's like, you know, it is not about us to try to put words in God's mouth or tell him what revelation we want. And I absolutely trust this. I do think there's, there's so much nuance when you're talking about revelation, because of course there's asking you shall receive. I, I do not believe the brethren all just sitting around just saying, okay, tell us what to do. <laughs> I think they have a lot of their ideas and they take it to the Lord, but we also don't know like what they get into. Like, like a good example in our history is um, President McKay wrestled with overturning the priesthood ban 20 years before it happened. But this wrestle was not a public thing for the church. This was not, he went to conference and said like, look, we know you're concerned about the priesthood ban. I have looked into this and said, no, he had talked with his associates within the, within the 12, within the first presidency and praying about it and seeking it out and never felt that it was appropriate at that time to go further with the issue. But this wasn't ever brought to the knowledge of the church overall. So I'm only saying that because Elder Renlund might be saying he wishes he knew more too. We don't know what kind of discussions they've had as apostles. We don't know what they've prayed about. We don't know if they've looked into these issues more and been told line upon line, And but now is not the time to give you that line uh, for whatever reason. And we don't always understand the reasonings to it. Yeah. I always say that because I think well, it's because we, because we don't, we don't know what the discussions are having behind the scenes and what things they might've had revealed to them or have been revealed to them and said, but it is not time to even engage the church at this level about these issues either. We don't know. Well, and, and it is a positive that he didn't come out and say, like, I think in the past they said, we don't talk about her because she's too special. She's too sacred. He didn't say yeah. that. He said, yeah. he said, okay, here's a, here's a resource. Here's what we know. But he, at least he didn't say, you know, like, well, don't even bring it up. It's, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a Which, step and, in the right direction. And he, he did. You're, you're very right. That it's a very important point. He didn't use any of those pat your head kinds of phrases to make you feel like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we don't talk. She's too special. You know, there, yeah. Yeah. there wasn't that. It wasn't like that patronizing, you know? Yeah, exactly. I know. That, I don't know where that talk came from. And overall, the women's session had some terrific talks. My notes weren't great. I was putting kids to bed, so I listened a lot. I just couldn't write anything down. Uh, so if you want to talk impressions then, <laughs> I had very good impressions from the women's session. And oh my goodness, Richie Stedman is Oh, on. look at that. Wait, hey, who, let, me. who let him in here? Excuse me. Excuse, sorry, my seat's in the middle. Can you guys, would you mind moving your legs? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> excuse, sorry, excuse me. Uh, did you did I you miss? at least bring so treats? Jeff, yeah. Yep, they're in the mail. So Jeff, we're gonna go back and start over, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, yep. Th- she's this like, is I want to show up for the last 10 minutes of a show. This Jeff, is Jeff Jeff forgot to hit record. So this was a fun way, his words, sure. that we could start again <laughs> from the beginning because he yeah. forgot to record. Hey, he's the one who's it's pushing 1030 yeah. now, so <laughs> oh, I'm living. I'm living the dream. When you tell it, I will say this: uh, when, since I telework full time now, it makes things like this a little bit easier than they used to be. I'd normally be like, "Yeah, I gotta get up at six. I don't get up at six, so that's good." Richie, it's nice to see you, man. How yeah, you good to see you guys too. What did I miss? For real? What did I miss? Well, Catch we just we, we just finished talking about Elder Renland and Heavenly Mother. So, oh. you, 
which you probably did on the cultural hall already just a little while ago. You're probably, you're probably good on that front. Well, well, I mean, so, uh, I, I didn't want to come in and tell people about the cultural hall. I just wanted to join the conversation, but I can. No, you don't have to. I was just, okay. just no one wants to hear it. No, I'm kidding. Do whatever you want. <laughs> well, um, so, so the only time that you can do a conference recap is on the Sunday after general conference at 7 PM. So if you're in the, uh, that's like if you're the in the podcast making business, around Mormon things, you have to do it at 7 p.m. so that you can't possibly have, you know, synergy between the podcasts. No, we, we, go. We, we schedule a thing. The thing that was interesting, the one takeaway for me is, so we had Mally Bonner on, if you guys know who that is. Uh, he directed Green Flake. Yeah. Um, he's working to help get a monument up at, uh, this is a place, Heritage Park for the church, for the Black Pioneers. Mm-hmm. He was in there and also we had Al Carraway and also uh, Rachel Hunt Steenbleck, who one of the m- most prolific, I would suppose, writing about Heavenly Mother, her and a couple other people. Yeah. Um, but she she talked a great deal about Heavenly Mother, right? That's why we had her there. And then we asked Mally, hey, what do you think about it? And he's like, I haven't really thought much about a Heavenly Mother. And so it was a really great conversation about how we can have conversations within the church. And not be like, I can't believe you wouldn't know about that. You idiot. You're so stupid. You know, all those kind of things that occur online. That was that was a big takeaway from what we did tonight. Cool. Yeah. Did you guys cry? Did you cry during conference? No. No, I'm a robot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What did you cry about, Devin? Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was during my favorite talk and I think it was during my favorite talk I was telling the guys about Michael Ringwood's talk which was I think for a lot of folks rather forgettable uh, but but he was talking about John 3:16 and 17 and and uh, John 3:16 we've heard a million times and 17 I just had never focused on and he's talked about the importance of 17 which is Christ came not to condemn but to save the world and I just, it occurred to me that if you filtered everything the brethren say with that lens, just put that lens over what they say, you'd say, oh, I see. This is, this is them trying to do this mission, right? Trying to save us, not condemn us. Oh, I'll hear it in that context. It just changes everything. It changes, yeah, it just, for me, it was really a profound moment uh, to, to yeah. think about, oh, they're trying to save me, not condemn me. Because sometimes, right? And you probably never felt this way, Richie. But but sometimes I feel like I listen to conference and I feel like, oh man, I just suck. Yeah. I'm doing everything wrong. I'm not nearly good enough. Uh, and so this just gave me a fresh new way to look at myself and the gospel and everything. And I just came away. Uh, jazzed by that talk. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, I no. I remember I teared up kind of on that one or one of them around that, but I think it was that one. I sobbed. I have never cried during general conference ever. In all of my years of general conferencing, I've never been emotional ever, like a robot, like Haley said. <laughs> they announced the temple in Cleveland, which is where <laughs> I serve my mission, I, and oh. I lost it. I, I lost it like heaving sobs for, for like 15 minutes. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. And, oh, that's great. And my wife who wasn't watching conference was like, who died? Oh, like no. it was, yeah. it, it was that intense of like a, a of tears and yeah. a sob. And, and it, it was crazy. Cause for 15 minutes, like the different people that, that I taught the different like places in Cleveland, the different ward houses and the church isn't very big, even though Kirtland is, you know, just to the East but just sobbed uncontrollably for 15 minutes and then was like, okay, pick yourself back up, put yourself together and oh, a, a great. great conference. Well, that's good. Man. That's, that is great. I'm not dead that inside. <laughs> I, I did not, I did not cry about Barcelona. I'm sorry. Wait, now was that in your mission? Cause I know you're a, yeah, that was my mission. Yeah. Barcelona. So, and why, why are you dead inside? What, <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> it was more exciting. Was, was, look, wrestling been, kids. <laughs> I've been I've been very blessed. Like we got I got the bar. Yeah, literally, it was probably because I was trying to make dinner. <laughs> You're like, did they say Barcelona? What? What's happening? <laughs> East Coast East Coast timing is really hard for the last session because I know they're going to bring up temples, but it's like nipping up on six o'clock on a Sunday for us. So I'm wearing my Bluetooth headphones, running around the kitchen, just trying to listen to conference and get stuff done and all that stuff. But I was like, woo, woo, woo. So I got pumped, but I've been very blessed. Barcelona a year ago, they announced the temple in Yorba Linda where I grew up. So I've, you know, I got, I got nothing to complain about. Um, another talk in our waning moments, I guess. Yeah. I did say on this podcast, I don't remember exactly when, but less than a month ago, my exact words were, mark my words, Elder Rasband will speak about religious freedom in general conference because that is all he talks about. And sure enough, the he man did. delivered. He spoke about religious freedom. I don't know if he's on, like, if his committee assignment is like the religious freedom committee. Cause, you know, you know, like when they run the missionary <laughs> yeah. department, they always give missionary talks. <laughs> I don't know what internal structure there is in place there and if that's why, but that has been his thing uh, for quite a while. And he just spoke. Uh, I don't always love the religious freedom drum beat because sometimes I feel like it misses a few of the areas that I'm more concerned about, like global. It always seems, seems like it has this very North American, very American centric lens for what religious freedom should be. But I like that he spoke a lot about other faiths and how we need to like work together and get along with them and respect one another and provide yeah. room for each other to worship. And that was good. I feel like some of his remarks seemed to, I might've misunderstood it, but it seemed like he was kind of, saying everything he was saying like the positive ecumenism between us was only about like the ones who also happened to respect us and we respect each other and i was kind of like all right what if you're like up against militant atheists like are you still like do they still have religious freedom are they <laughs> also part of this discussion i don't know yeah. but uh, religious freedom yeah, to a point jeff <laughs> religious yeah. freedom to a, i mean not not freedom person no i don't know i don't know yeah i think uh I thought his talk was really quite good. Uh, and, you know, his selling points for why we should protect uh, religious freedom, I thought were really solid. Um, choosing to talk about it, I think, elevates a concern uh, that really isn't a big concern in the United States. There is no one seriously talking about telling Latter day Saints that they can't believe what they believe can't yeah. worship the way they choose. There is really no threat to the fundamental things he was talking about today in the United States. Globally, there are places where there are threats. And Russia, to name a, a name, is a, is a great example. China is another great example. You know, the right to assemble, the right to meet, the right to proselyte, all of those things are are uh, limited. The right to speak religiously in China and Russia, just as two examples of countries I've visited where there are strict limits. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's a big deal. That those rights aren't threatened in the United States. So I always worry that when there's a talk like this in General Conference, that the North Americans view this as an imminent threat here and a reason that they should be politically active in a direction that I don't follow. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it, it has a political feeling to me that seems a little bit misdirected. Uh, and I, and I'm not sure that uh, Elder Rasman meant that uh, because he is talking about a, 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 you know, a global church and, and all these global issues and going to global conferences. And so I think he is thinking more about, the fact that the church is not allowed to do some things in some countries and should be allowed to do the, those things. To, we should be allowed to worship and preach and proselyte, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons I somebody posted this on or this on Instagram and I reposted it because I loved it. But uh, they said what defending freedom of religion should look like, and it should look like defending minority religions, fighting for religious refugees and creating space for those who are different from you. Um, I think those are all great ways to defend religious freedom and maybe not <laughs> the ways that um, some people were thinking uh, yeah, he was yeah. talking about. So that's how I choose to take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, 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 you know, I do agree with Devin. I feel like I, I've gotten burned out on like the religious freedom talk. Cause it's usually through a North American lens. I like that on a Rasband. I, I think his, 
his parameters and explanations were a little bit more <laughs> globalist, I guess, for lack of a better expression. But that resonated with me more. I thought it, I, I think overall it was good. And I was, I wrote that he wrote four ways societies benefit from religious freedom. Uh, my notes say it honors the great commandment to love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor. And then religious freedom fosters expressions of relief, hope, and peace. And then for three and four, I just wrote, uh, uh. Yeah, I have no three or four either. I just have one and two. <laughs> oh, God. So I don't know what it was. If anybody finds out, please, please let us know. Well, we're only going to be. We really only have half the, half of the code so far. So. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I love when, when talks have bullet points because I love like making lists. I'm like, number one, I love it because then it makes me listen more because I'm like, oh, wait, what number are we on? But that was yeah. one of the reasons I, I love the prophet's talk because he had like his list of five things and but just but i loved that his number five was end to end conflict in our personal life and Mm -hmm. i'm Mm, uh as someone who avoids confrontation and contention at all costs um i'm always you know looking to make sure that i'm like okay how, how am I doing and with my relationships with everyone? But I think it's it's great for, as a reminder to just kind of check in and I don't know. We want to live in a loving world where we're trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. And so I, I like a reminder to check in with myself and see how I'm doing there. That's yeah. how uh, Haley always winds up doing these shows. By the way, she she avoids confrontation so much. She just says, yeah, okay, okay. She just okay. acquiesces so she doesn't okay. have to tell you no. Okay, good. Okay. All right, perfect. Okay, good. Consummate people pleaser right here. I've heard that's really healthy. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, President Elson's talk was great. Uh, one thing I was, in like a perverse way, I was really happy. He actually said the words Ukraine and Russia as someone who's been tracking the situation. Yes, I noticed that. And the church, because they'd referenced He's very it cautious times. about it. But they'd referenced it many times at conference. There was elders. Ah, who was it? Was it Elder Stevenson? Someone spoke about uh, the people in Poland. You know, the, the, who left the strollers on the yeah. On oh the yeah, Elder Stevenson mm-hmm. on the platform. We've seen that one in the news. Mm-hmm. And he said, like the the people in Poland left this for the incoming refugees, without saying like anything else about like who right. they were. And I know this is because the church is just threading a really hard needle here. Because think about it. I'm assuming they're broadcasting a general conference in Russia. Sure. That's what they want to do. And obviously, Russia's censors are there. And if, if the second they would say, like, you know, as we aid Ukrainian refugees during the war with Russia, boom. Oh, the feed yeah. Gets cut. The feed will get cut. I get it. It's yeah. hard. So, um, so I was amazed. I mean, he didn't say much other than saying I've been to Ukraine and Russia many times. Yeah. He didn't play sides. But I did yes, love this quote. Careful. His quote was, any war is a horrifying violation of everything the Lord Jesus Christ stands for and teaches. Um, those are strong words. I mean, that is like, that's, that's, that's borderline like gospel of pacifism right there. That is, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty and intense. Any, any war, any war. But now we're going to go sing that song on our bed and our like so much. We but should war. add to that. <laughs> we should all get, it should be required after baptism that we have that tattooed on our arms, I think. <laughs> That's what it should be. We should do a make a. There should be a recitation after every baptism when everyone stands up and says, "And now we're yes, going to repeat." That's a great quote. Words from President Nelson from April 2022, and everyone. But did you notice, Jeff, the tie? I'm sure you did. You guys do that tie tracker thing. Oh yeah. The tie of President Nelson. Uh, a very is? obvious blue and yellow. Oh no! Well, oh, uh, I think that's what it. Elder uh, Renland also wore a blue yeah, and yellow. Tie, yes, you think? I yes. never noticed ties. A thousand percent, <laughs> a thousand percent intentional. Ailey, you have to follow the tie tracker. I, where for the past ten years, I've, I've we, been missing we, out. I just, oh we, wow, okay. We catalog, we catalog all of the uh, neckwear yeah. trends during conference. It was a lot more fun when President Uchtdorf was in the first presidency because he changes his tie every session, so you'd always get something. If there was a rainbow tie, I'd probably notice that, but <laughs> I haven't noticed. Okay, that's interesting. Blue and it, yellow. It doesn't usually tell you anything <laughs> wild. Only thing, folks, for the tie tracker. It actually got exciting this time. Red ties were like way. It was just a very red tie conference overall. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, the blue blue ties just started percolating up on the back end there, and blue managed to overtake red on the very last talk by President Uchtdorf. It was wild, wild. <laughs> there time. we go. Just like American politics. Love to see it. <laughs> I, I want to bring it up again, Jeff, because there's more to it than that. It is intentional. If you don't think that whomever costumes air quotes the prophet of the church for his last talk 
if you do not think that that tie was intentional and a statement, I think you're foolish. Was, was this yellow? Okay, I think I'm seeing the one though. It's more of a. It's blue like, and yellow. It's a shimmery sky blue. It looks yeah. like it's like got small white stripes on it. Are they yellow no, stripes? It is blue and yellow. It is a oh. very obvious blue and yellow. Elder, well, then tie. what's with everyone else wearing red? Who's apparently backing Russia? Is this? Are we well, saying they're President, communists, Jeff? President That's Nelson, what that yeah. is. President Nelson stands alone. Yeah. Just he That's and Elder right. Renlund are like, you guys got this. I, I just, I just have oh. to think. I just have to think it's a consideration that they, okay. yes, <laughs> that they, that they intentionally did whatever it means. I'm not sure, but that they absolutely did it on purpose. It wasn't just, well, here's the cleanest one. Well, this is something he got over to the ZCMI. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Well. Clothing always sends a message. Please. I wasn't, Especially, I wasn't paying attention, know. but yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> All right. We are running very long. Any other talks yeah. that anybody wants to hit upon that we haven't discussed yet? Like we haven't talked about Elder Oaks on Sunday, Elder Oukdor, for example. I don't know. Anybody, or anybody else who jumped I in. I loved Elder Oukdor's talk. It was great. Oh, I loved his joke. Even though I saw it coming a mile away, I loved it. <laughs> tell, tell, tell our listeners what the joke was. Well, the joke was first he talked about bicycling with his wife and just, you know, he made the analogy um, of, you know, bicycling and how that er, relates to looking forward and staying on, or heading forward toward Christ. Momentum, right? And then he said, for those of you who are not, you know, do not, do not enjoy, I think he did say bicycling at one point. It was very cute. Um, <sighs> then perhaps I have another analogy for you that you'll, definitely be able to relate to more and he can, i said a few other things and he's like it's flying a plane which we all knew and it was just so delightful i loved we it we love him <laughs> bless his heart doing good things uh, elder oh. oaks kind of drew a line in the sand right mm. he's like you know he did that did his thing that will be the that and elder renland from women's session will be the most talked about talks from general conference for sure and did you guys already talk about the plants? The ones that looked no. like they were from Pandora. From yeah, Africa. that looked like they were from Pandora or Jurassic Park behind the speakers. I, those were pretty good because I saw the ones. I was like, I'll give them a pass because I still remember a conference two years ago when COVID started, and it looked like they got the elders quorum to decorate that little theater, yes. <laughs> and it was like the worst decorations ever. Or, so the, yeah, was that the one when every everyone was really shiny, like the the yes. makeup? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I remember Makeup that. Was shiny. I mean, in their defense, we <laughs> shut down the church in the middle of March, and they had two weeks to try to figure out how to do redo conference yeah. under the, that setting. So, we'll we'll give them a pass. A part of me, a little bit like I got so used to like the intimacy of COVID conference, I I already kind of miss it. I don't mind yeah. all the conference center stuff, but I kind of love this like little theater with just a couple people there. And I I thought it was like interesting because when they said it was going to be half attendance for general conference, I sort of thought they'd do every other row, and I think what they did, and I don't know. Um, maybe someone can email you contact yeah, this week at com. They just said, sit wherever you'd like. Yeah. And everyone sat down low and then no one was up in the rafters, but I thought that they would every other row folks or something like I that. S- I saw some, str- some people out in like the boonies who are like, dad, I can sit up here on the far left. No one's going to be around me. It'll be great. I can do what I want. No one's going to bother me. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a funny experience with that. The other, so we've still been do- done like staggered seating at church. Um, we, we're not wearing masks anymore, but it's still every other pew is open. And they've primarily kept it open so that it's easier. For, they don't, our bishop doesn't want deacons. He wants deacons passing the sacrament, holding the tray and not passing mm-hmm. the tray around hand okay. to hand. Okay. That's the main reason why that's really all it is, which meant it's actually a lot easier. So then there was like a, there was an event or something in the church and we got, I was there early for Bishop Brick meeting and everything. And when we came in the chapel, all the signs that say, please don't sit on this row were gone because they took them out for this event and nobody put them back. And so we're like, okay. And so we discussed it really quick and they're just like, we're not going to say anything from the pulpit. You know, we've been doing this for a while. We'll just let the members just figure it out. They're going to be fine. But this was like a case where the second you take away the written regulation, that sacrament meeting, everyone just filled in, just, pu- just, <laughs> just boom, just person to person everywhere. It felt so weird to have people right in front of me and behind me. I'm like looking around like for snotty kids. I'm like, get away, get away from me, people. Um, and then the next week we printed signs again and put them back. And you could see a lot of people were like, <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> and we never announced anything. We're just like quiet. It's like the most passive aggressive approach to governing the ward ever. So. We had a family of 
12, like they had 10 kids move away during the pandemic um, from our ward and they sat on the second row and no one to this day has <laughs> sat in that row. <laughs> honoring their memory. yeah it's so weird i just keep waiting and i'm like should we go sit up i don't know it's weird <laughs> it's like i love it's that like in uh, memoriam there, were, there was some tweet a couple weeks ago that it turns out was from a desnat account but it was okay it was still pretty funny where it just said like if you really want to troll somebody if there's somebody like that offends you and you're worried you don't like them like deliberately get there early and take the spot they usually sit in yes <laughs> just be just passive aggressively just oh, that is way too much con- contention for yeah. me that's too much we need, hear, we, we need contention at church. <laughs> that's what we need to be that's I did point. hear today in one in one a couple of times I thought I heard a couple of rebukes for Desnat. I, I, I doubt they heard them. But there are a couple of things about you know, like the Lord doesn't need uh Oh yeah. Uh, doesn't need you to defend sheriff. Him. He needs you to share. Yeah, he doesn't need a sheriff or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who said that? Yeah. I don't remember that line. Uh Elder Stevenson, I think. Wasn't oh, it? Why. When hmm. he was talking about how we like share what we love about okay. the gospel. Yeah, it was the sharing talk. Was that Elder Stevenson? Uh-huh. Yeah, love, he didn't love sharing. He said, love our neighbors, share yeah, yeah, and invite. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was the one. Okay. Yeah, and then somebody and, and, and applied it, it, that it quote to someone else's conflict talk. Conflict quotes, too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I have two questions before I'm going to bounce out because I'm tired. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna... The first question is, uh, Devin, how did you get that fantastic bookstore into your trailer as you travel around the country? Aren't you in a trailer traveling around and yet you have the typical backdrop for yeah. anything that is done on Zoom? How did we do that? Is it a fake or are you, did no, you bring that it, bookshelf with you? So, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm so glad that people have paid a little bit of attention, uh, but uh yeah, we, we are in the process of buying an electric pickup truck and and putting solar panels on a trailer. And But uh, the first thing we did was to buy a little condo here in Jacksonville where we can live while we do all of this. So okay. uh, I'm in my condo in Jacksonville. And uh, yeah, so... So if you're ever in a place, ever in need of a place in Jacksonville, likely Devin <laughs> won't be there, and you can break in and steal his books. Perfect. Uh, Something like that. I don't Something that, like though. that. The the other thing I wanted to ask is, did you guys talk about how uh, President Bingham presided over the women's session? I thought that was significant and did worth. They actually noting. used the word presiding over yes. the session because I missed the very beginning of the women's yep, session. That she was presiding. And that everyone else would be speaking within it, and they called it. Um, they made they made great pains to call it a session of general conference, as opposed to the women's session or, an a, you know, an additional session of general conference. Yeah. That they just but, oh w- that that part was interesting. So first, when President Oaks gave his little remarks and and introduced stuff, at first I was like, what do you like? This is what we've been doing, President Oaks. Like, what's the big, what's the big deal? Like, what? But as we've looked at it, we realized no, because like the last time they did a women's session was October of 2020, and um, then it was this typical structure where you had a handful of the female leaders spoke, but then the entire first presidency would give talks afterwards. That's what they've been doing. So this was different in that sense. So Elder mm-hmm. Oaks kind of laid it out, said, "Here are the crown rules." I guess I did not know that Sister Bingham was presiding. I totally yeah, I didn't know that either. I was at a high is, school production yeah. of Matilda. So. Mm. I, I saw Matilda it. in New York. I wasn't impressed. I'm not gonna lie. Well, I'm sure your your progeny did wonderfully. Um, but for uh, me, of course, <laughs> that's not right. That's not, that's just stuck in my head forever. Um, I didn't realize she presided though. That's actually very interesting. Yeah, that right? is. Yeah, yeah. And so what that I'm explains about- why you know I missed it in President Oak's talk, but he he had this weird introductory session that was all about kind of the rules of the game. And I guess the whole point of that was to explain the rules of the game in which she was presiding, which I think is great. Uh, but yeah, I had missed two. And I I'm didn't curious. understand why he was explaining the rules of the game for something that seemed routine. But yes, that was not routine to have a sister preside mm-hmm. over a session of general conference. I'm also curious how techni- technically speaking – and I'm not complaining about it, but how she can preside if an apostle is present, just with the way we do things. You know how it is. Like if your stake president shows up in sacrament meeting, he immediately presides over the meeting mm-hmm. because that's how it is. Mm-hmm. So I am just, just, just structurally how that works. Like they're, are they able to just like willingly cede presiding authority? Yeah. <laughs> so then 
<laughs> yeah. So if that is that, will that become a precedent? Because I'm thinking of like other like training meetings, stake, you know, auxiliary training meetings for Relief Society, Young Women's and Primary, where you have like those presidents there, but you also have a member of the stake presidency. But I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. Curious. Food for thought. I hope, uh, I'm curious if in the future, maybe will there not be a first presidency member there at all? Was this just Elder Oaks kind of telling us what was going to go down, but then next time they do one, he won't even be present. He'll just have an apostle show up at the end. Well, next time they'll say there will be a session and then there won't be a session. <laughs> yeah. And then there will be a session and then there won't be a session. <laughs> And, and then there will be a session. So who, who, knows? who knows? And I wonder if they're going to stick with this or if we're going to do priesthood again in October or if priesthood session is just gone. I mean, oh. they have to keep us on our toes, right? So we've got to keep. That's the only way to keep, only way to keep us tuning in. That's right. Um, it has been a, a ginormous episode of this show. So I think we'll, we'll call it here. Let everyone move on with their lives. <laughs> and, um, Haley's secretly saying, oh, I wish I'd said no. <laughs> I can't say no. No, I'm just I'm just so proud of us for <laughs> and so here finding so much to talk about when when I was worried that I hadn't paid attention enough. <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone for being here, Richie. Nice of you to pop in, buddy. It's well, thanks for letting me. On a little bit. Yeah, man, good to have you here. So go go visit Rizzi over at the Cultural Hall. Go, vi- I called you Rivy. Go visit Rivy at the Cultural Hall, um, and join him on Patreon if you want. You can follow Devin on. I almost said your marker on the world. What are you technically called now, Devin? What's we, the- uh, superpowers for good and our there solar you. trailer.com. Check out Devin. Uh, Haley, do you have anything you want to promote? <laughs> no, no, stay tuned. Young women go to, go to your class and listen yes. to sister Smith. Yeah. There's, Remember there's who deal. you are. And uh, folks, you can find us at thisweekinmormons.com. Please support us on patreon.com slash thisweekinmormons. Throw a little bit at us, and uh, we'll see you on social media as well. But I will be done now because this has been one of the longest episodes we've done in a very long time since Meryl Jensen talked to us for two and a half hours, and I had to edit that down to an hour and ten minutes, and that was a lot of fun. He was awesome. Very nice guy. So thanks for being here, everybody. I appreciate all of you, my co-hosts. Thanks, guys. Bye. Good to have you. Thanks for listening to Twim, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.